In 1947, President Harry Truman signed an executive order forming a highly classified committee made up of government officials, military leaders, and scientists whose sole purpose was to investigate alien spacecraft. Or did he? Today, we take a look at this alleged group known as Majestic 12. We'll discuss the story of its uncovering, the investigation it's alleged that they were a part of, and what a federal investigation determined about this committee. We'll also tell the story of Richard Doty, an Air Force officer whose job was to spread UFO misinformation, which led to one man being checked into a mental health facility. I'm Mike. I'm Ian. And I'm Dave. If you thought tonight's show was about College Mike's gigantic cock, stick around. He actually had to bang those sorority girls three times to give him that majestic 12-incher. This is Necronomapod. Somewhere, something that we can look at, touch, feel I think you've asked the wrong question. By the nature of the beast, the pieces that were picked up at Roswell, for example, which are described in the document that was alluded to earlier, are not available for your viewing or my viewing. They clearly are top secret eyes only, something above that. Uh, let me respond, if I may, to an issue that's come up here that I think is very important. These alleged top secret eyes only documents provide ABC, provide the nation, an opportunity to find out for themselves firsthand what sort of nonsense the UFO proponents are spouting. So to get started, we got some uh, housekeeping stuff to get through um, off the top here. I know a lot of times we save it for the end, but we're going to kick it off right now. Uh, first thing is, I know we were all getting pretty fired up earlier, especially Ian. We're ready to, to fight tonight. Um, all the bootlegging of our shit on Amazon. What is going on? Did we officially make it? Is that what this means? Like that we made it, we're famous, we're big time? Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't love it. Um, I think people just run algorithm searches on images using SEO stuff and just replicate and auto put it up for sale. I think there's a lot of that going on. Yeah, we've had some people sending us stuff that they found on Amazon. Like today, someone sent us a uh, some kind of, it was a Necronomapod calendar day planner that had our like <laughs> alien abduction UFO logo on it. And he was like, is this, is this legit? And no, it is not. Well, that was in the UK store too. So maybe Rose West in prison can buy that and plan out her day. Yeah, yeah. there, there she go. goes. <laughs> So just to be clear, um, our stuff on Amazon is sold directly from Amazon. If you see anything else out there that says Necronomapod or has our logo and it is not being sold directly from Amazon, it is not ours. They are stealing from us. It is not legit. The, on top of that, the only things we sell currently are T-shirts, tank tops, zip-up hoodies, pullover hoodies, long sleeve T-shirts, and phone cases. If you see anything else on Amazon that is not ours, it is someone ripping us off. So make sure you check for that. Make sure you, it's, it's one of those things that you're purchasing and make sure it's, you're directly buying it from Amazon. Uh, no other sellers have our permission or authorization to use our, our name and logo. Yeah, those Necro so. Maxi Pads, those are not real. Those are, <laughs> those are pirated. Exactly. As much Plus, as you girls you might love them, not real. Not real merchandise. If you want Necronomapod inside, you just wait for Cucks Across America and I'll be right there. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes uh, to your vag yes, you don't want knockoff stuff <laughs> exactly <laughs> and if you need treatment you go to dave's gynecology the best in the business unlicensed and very uh, economically fair <laughs> what did i say no so, yeah. no copay no li no license no copay i think that was the tagline <laughs> <laughs> i haven't heard it in a long time i don't remember <laughs> but it's good to hear you guys are still in business still operating Oh, yeah. Doing a whirlwind business here. Yeah. We, we do a lot of video appointments during COVID. Of course. You have to. Yeah, you know, it's great. And it automatically streams, uh, uploads right up to Pornhub as well, right? <laughs> That's, you have right. Like a, That's right. Like a joint sponsorship with them. I got multiple income streams here. <laughs> <laughs> One of those like premium accounts on Pornhub or something. <laughs> Not that I don't know. I don't know if they have that. I'm just assuming maybe they have premium <laughs> accounts. I mean, I don't know what they do on porn websites. I don't use them. I read the Bible. You get like a one to 10 rating. And depending on what your vagina looks like, you either go to Pornhub or you go to like a medical deformity cam for, <laughs> you know, people that are or into like, that sort of thing. 
you get put on porn or like one of those like uh, porn websites that's just nothing but like viruses <laughs> uploaded to your computer when you click on it. <laughs> that's right. The dark side of porn. I kid, I kid. All vaginas are beautiful. Well, okay. <laughs> So anyways, our merch is on Amazon.com. Search for Necronomapod. International shipping is still, I think, questionable, unavailable because of the pandemic. We do have inquiries in with Amazon, but uh, essentially at this point, they're just telling us that they're, you know, to hold hold tight and they'll, they'll have it back up at some point. So we appreciate everyone uh, not in the U.S. That, that is looking for stuff. We know you guys want some merch. It's just out of our hands right now, unfortunately. But you can get koozies and stickers available at Necronomapod.com if you wish to have that. So check that out. And our, our lazy ass never took down the Black Friday sale. So if you hurry up and get on there and get some pretty sweet deals. Speaking of our website, if you want a little two for one, get yourself some deals on koozies and stickers. We currently have our annual vote going for the first topic you guys want us to cover for 2021. A vote going at Necronomapod.com. There are four options. Dave, would you like to tell them what the options are? Number one, the West Memphis Three. Number two, Israel Keys. Number three. Leonard Lake, Charles Eng, and number four perennial favorite, the always not guilty, Casey Anthony. <laughs> God damn, those are four popular topics. Probably the four most requested topics we get. I agree. Yeah, for sure. Hopefully it's a dogfight. I want to see a real close race. Comes down to the wire. We posted that on, what's the date? January, uh, I'm sorry, January. Fuck, I'm living in the future. December 10th. And we're going to let it run for two weeks. So you have until December 24th, Christmas Eve, to get your vote in at Necronomapod.com. It's got all four pictures of uh, the topics up there. Click on the one you want. And uh, the, the leader will know by December 24th who the winner is. And then that show will be the first topic that we cover in January. So we did that last year. And the winner was... Uh, who the fuck won last year? John Manan. John Benet Ramsey, that's right. And then that took seven weeks of episodes to get through. Yeah. <laughs> and we did it. Well, if it's and it ended Memphis up being three, it'll be another seven week. It'll be a long <laughs> That's long a long January. story, yeah. I've wanted to do West Memphis three for a while, so you know, that would be fun. Um and John Benet turned into one of my favorite series we've ever covered. So you never know. But so yeah, voting at Necronomapod.com. While you're there, pick up some stickers and koozies. But those are the four topics. Voting is now open. Go uh Cast your vote, and we'll know the answer on Christmas Eve. Um, uh, Mike, Mike I had to, a question real quick. Is Casey yes, Anthony sir? prohibited from voting? She's allowed to vote for herself, correct? She's allowed to vote, yeah. Okay, great. Just Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. We'll make sure we tweet her, too, and direct message her and email her and contact her agent and let her know. Yeah, I've been trying. Um, trying. You know. no, no return. No return uh, correspondence. Mm, fishy. Uh, last thing to cover, making a few slight changes to our Patreon at least at the $10 tier, due to uh, listener feedback and overall feedback we've been getting from patrons, the $10 tier of our Patreon is going to change slightly. The $1 tier and the $5 tiers are going to say the same. Nothing's going to change for that. The $10 tier, you're still going to get three bonus shows a month, and you're still going to get the early, the Sunday shows early, and they get those ad-free, correct, Ian? Yeah. So you'll still get those early and ad-free. With the new $10 tier, here's what you're going to get. The Zooms are going to become quarterly, so we're going to do those every three months. Uh, so you'll probably get four in 2021. You're also going to get to vote every month on one of the three bonus shows that we do. The $10 patrons will get to, again, this is all for the $10 tier. You'll get a quarterly Zoom. You'll get to vote on one of the three bonus shows we do every month. We'll give you a, a few topics to pick from. The $10 patrons get to pick. And last but not least, you will get an exclusive to the $10 tier once a month Bible Babble bonus episode. What? Exclusive <laughs> to the $10 tier. Yeah, we didn't tell Dave until just now. He's doing uh, bonus work for the show. <laughs> Thanks for the heads up. Yep, we got you, pal. I, I, I so mean, I just need it. to promote the Lord and, and the Bible to all the faithful followers out there. And I, I think it's time. It's time has come. So it's been, people have been asking about it since we, uh, you know, even kind of joked about it, really. It started as a joke, but people wanted it. Dave's going to deliver because he's that kind of guy. 
That's you know, true. He of is. course, if you pay him ten bucks a month. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so uh, that'll be starting in January. December is going to stay the same, but starting in January again, the zooms are going to move to quarterly. Ten dollar patrons will get to vote on one of the bonus shows uh, that we do per month, every month. And you will also get an exclusive to the $10 tier, Bible Babble with your pal Dave, every month. That's me. At the $10 level. Hello. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so that's all starting in January. Big things. Really big things. I was going to say, you guys' enthusiasm is overwhelming. <laughs> Speaking of big things, are we talking about Majestic 12 tonight? Boom. <laughs> that is a transition, motherfucker. <laughs> Mike, I apologize for my uh, facetious opening there. I, I don't. I don't want to ever. I thought it was great. Malign it was your, your history as as the king of the frat hey. house. Hey, when I'm telling the story, it's just about my delivery. You know, I, I I would ask that nobody go back and and talk to the women of my college days because I don't want my reputation destroyed. <laughs> well, they send us messages all the time, and we we try not to mention those on the air. <laughs> Old small cock Mike, that's what they call me. <laughs> But he sure does try hard. <laughs> A for effort, minuscule Mikey. <laughs> minuscule Mikey. <laughs> New shirt coming to Amazon, minuscule Mikey. <laughs> hey, Mikey, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, Majestic 12. <laughs> so yeah, tonight we are going to be talking about Majestic 12. And this one's going to tie back in with our Roswell episode really well, so... If you haven't listened to Roswell, might be a good thing to listen to that one first and then uh, head over for this one. So Roswell, th that that was the initial episode you guys did by yourselves before I before I joined you guys. Yeah. And I always forget that like we didn't. When did we actually release the the, the show? Like when did we do the show? Was it like a month or two in? Um, you know, I don't know. It was a while in. Yeah, because like in my mind, Roswell was always our first show, but it actually it wasn't. We just recorded it like three or four times as like a practice run. I always forget that it came out like a while after. Not too long, yeah. though. I think like, like maybe a month or two. Like we had about five or six episodes out already, I think. It was uh, March 24th, 2019 in the year of our Lord. Yeah. And we started our first show was like, what, January 12th? Yeah. So we were like eight weeks in, eight, ten weeks in. Mm -hmm. It was uh, right after Screen Door Intruder Richard Ramirez. Look at that. And right before the first episode of Jonestown. Fond memories, pals. Fond memories. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Throwback days. <laughs> All available in our archives. That's before anyone knew who Mr. Muggs was. It's true. Yeah. Before he became a legend. Yeah. Pour one out for Muggs. <laughs> so if you haven't listened to Roswell, go back, download it, listen to it right now, and then come back. So back in 1984, a TV producer named Jamie Shandera had been working on a fictional movie about UFOs but it had been stopped due to funding issues. For help in developing the story, he had help from a guy named Bill Moore. You'll remember Bill Moore from our episode on Roswell, because he was the guy that co-authored the first book on the Roswell incident, did a lot of research for it, and he was always a main speaker at a lot of UFO conventions. So was Bill a great resource for fictional movie writing because of the, the whole weather balloon plot line, that kind of stuff? Yeah. <laughs> He was. Okay. <laughs> I'm already, I've already got myself prepared for all the weather balloon jokes tonight. <laughs> um, Mike, what does UFO stand for? Can you remind our listeners? Uh, unidentified flying object. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I wasn't sure he was going to get that or not. It's, it's always MUFON and NICAP that can fuse me. But MUF is, isn't MUFON Mutual Unidentified Flying Object Network? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then I don't remember NICAP. Yeah, I mean the the answer I was going for, Mike, was unlimited fucking <laughs> orgasms, which I believe we tied back to your <laughs> door, your yeah. frat house room at some point. <laughs> As the oh, UFO we did acronym unlimited. Oh, fucking I don't orgasms. recall that. <laughs> I, I think I can't that was in the Billy sections. Meyer episode. <laughs> I have zero recollection of that. Yeah, we, we but it's know. true. We know. It's true. It's true. A lot of the the girls that I uh, you know courted back in college have UFO tattoos on their shoulders. <laughs> I mean, it's not like in a creepy like cult way. Like I, you know, I fucking was playing volleyball with knee pads or anything. But <laughs> right. they had, uh, you know, they would get tattoos that said UFO because just like as a symbol and tribute to the unlimited orgasms they achieved in you know dorm room twelve. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's quite a tribute. I mean, that, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I agree. How do you think they explain those tattoos to their current bows, just or, or their their spouse these days? Just I think they just said they went through a phase where they were really into uh, to aliens. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, or you know, a phase where they were really into being probed, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boy! Duly noted. Two week, two weeks of talking about serious murder and rape, and this is what happens yeah. when we do a non-serious. Uh, I need, episode. I need some of this. I'm tired of the fucking Wests, man. <laughs> we're two sentences in, and we're already off the rails. <laughs> On an afternoon in December of 1984, Jamie received a Manila envelope to his North Hollywood home. It had no return address, but it was postmarked from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Inside was a smaller envelope, and inside that was a third smaller envelope. The third envelope was also unmarked besides a Marriott hotel logo on the back, and inside the third envelope was a roll of film. Hmm. Envelope and an envelope and an envelope. Packaged very well. Hmm. It's like one of those little Russian nesting dolls. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> hmm. Have you guys ever been in Albuquerque? No. I have not. It's beautiful. I like Albuquerque. Yeah? I love it out there. It's a lot of MMA fighters out in Albuquerque. It's like yeah. a big uh, fight town. And Walter White, too. Before doing anything with the film, Jamie thinks that it was Bill Moore who sent this to him because Bill was from New Mexico and they had kept in touch after the UFO movie fell through. The two had plans to meet for dinner that night, so Jamie took the role of film with him. When they sat down and started talking, Bill was just as surprised as Jamie was about the package because he knew nothing about it. After they left the restaurant, the two went back to Bill's house to develop the film in Bill's kitchen sink. And when they looked at the roll under a magnifying glass, they realized that they're not normal photos. They're photos taken of documents. Intriguing. Hmm. Do you know what restaurant they were at? I don't. I was curious. <laughs> not important. <laughs> It must have been a dark house if they could dark room in the kitchen sink, right? I picture all these UFO researcher guys living in very dark houses. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> like tri triple drapes, up. no light ever gets in there. <laughs> yeah. it's like the government's watching me, they got their tinfoil hats on. There are photos of eight documents, typewritten and stamped at the bottom, quote, top secret, magic eyes only being spelled M-A-J-I-C, shortened for the project we're going to be talking about in this episode, Majestic 12. The first five pages are a briefing for incoming President Eisenhower, dated November 18, 1952. According to the briefing, Majestic 12 was a top-secret committee that reported directly to the president. It was created by the previous president, Harry Truman, after the crash at Roswell. Hey, uh, Ian, I had a magic vagina-only project when I was in the White House. I make the cigars disappear. <laughs> That's still the craziest thing ever that he was into doing that. <laughs> hey, a, to each their own? Yeah, it was a Cohibas and Clits night every Monday in the White House. Cohibas and Clits. Loved it. <laughs> Didn't he have to admit that, like, in front of Congress and shit, that he did that? Oh, yeah. He talked himself into a corner. He, in his deposition, he's like, well, it depends what your definition of is is. <laughs> like, well, this ain't going to end good. That's true. They, I mean, they went through every single, like, word and tried to figure oh, out yeah. how to, like, get away with it and, like, what sexual intercourse was. You know, that's why he said, I did not have sex with that woman. Because yeah. then he came back later and was like, well, to me, sex is That's when, right. you know, a penis goes in a vagina. He's a smart so, guy, man. He tried it. He tried his best, but he yeah. he almost got there. But uh, that goddamn Lim Linda trip fucked him. She's a trip. <laughs> she is a trip. <laughs> I got to say, though, I love Harry Truman. One of my favorite presidents. Mike, you're a big president guy. I think Harry Truman's extremely um, fascinating. I'm excited to uh, read about him. Yeah. There's a. New book out, Dave. You were gonna you were gonna read that one. Did you get it yet? Joe Scarborough's book? No, it's on my yeah. list. I'm gonna be reading that. Yeah, there's. Uh, I think Harry Truman's very. I think he's underrated and and or at least understudied. I think he should be studied more. And I don't think he is because you know you got FDR and then after FDR you kind of move like you know you know about Truman dropping the the atomic bombs or whatever mm -hmm. and then you kind of skip ahead to like. The, the 50s and Happy mm -hmm. America and Eisenhower and then right into like the Kennedys and Camelot and all that. And I, I feel like Truman kind of gets skipped over in that age of like, you know, four. 
you know, that's that's three out of those four presidents were just like such big, powerful figures. And I think Truman gets overlooked a lot of times. I, I, I think that's right. I mean, the American education system being what it is. I mean, you know, they learn about World War Two, but Truman ends up really, I guess, being a footnote and not really explored very deeply after FDR right. and World War Two concludes there. They talk about, yeah, him, that's you right. know, making the decision to drop the atomic bomb. And I think that's the last you hear about Truman. That's really it. Yeah. He's just a footnote. I, yeah. I, that's, I just think maybe not not underrated. You know, that's up to everyone else to make their own mind, but at least understudied for sure. Yeah. Well, he's an interesting guy, too. So I'm looking forward to that book. Yeah. As you were, Ian. The, the actual date is muddy, but at some point in the first week of July 1947, something crashed on a ranch in Corona, New Mexico and was found by rancher Mac Brazell. It was reported to the police station in Roswell, New Mexico, because Corona didn't have a police station. And two intelligence officers from the Army Airfield 509th Operation Group were sent out to investigate. The RAAF put out a press release on July 8, 1947, that said they had recovered a, quote, flying disc. But this was later dialed back, and they said that it was a weather balloon that crashed. Oh, I've never heard that before. Weather balloon? Is that what it was? <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> if any of you ever meet Ian, the first thing you should say to him when you meet him is, Roswell was a weather balloon. And then wait for his reaction. <laughs> That's my advice to all of you. And right after you say it, just stare him in the eyes and take a big bite of a cookie. <laughs> <laughs> and be like, don't say hi to me or anything. Delicious. <laughs> be awesome. So depending on what story you go off of, there was a UFO, and in some accounts there were alien bodies recovered along with the UFO. According to the Majestic 12 documents, all of this was real. So we, when we did our, our Roswell episode, we kind of blended the two together. Remember we said Philip Corso, who wrote one of the books on Roswell, wrote it like it was an action movie, and then Stan Friedman yes. and, and uh, Bill Moore, they treated it more like, uh, you know, their version of events or what they felt was was real yeah according to majestic 12 all that stuff was real even the the crazy uh the crazy aspects of it like that there were alien bodies and stuff like those the little aliens right like because they were like the tiny little things that were like fitting in that in that craft right your standard gray yeah well i think we've all seen them autopsied in at area 51 <laughs> 20 years ago which yeah. was totally believable right <laughs> That was so funny a couple years ago when it was added to, when they added that on Netflix for whatever fucking reason. <laughs> I was watching it and Angie came on. She's like, what the fuck are you watching? <laughs> like, don't you remember this shit from back in the 90s? It, it's so funny because on YouTube now there's videos of the people that made all those old videos explaining how they faked everything. Like uh, Faces of Death. Like those guys just sit around and, and laugh and talk about how they made the Face of Death movie. And people to this day think that that was real. I don't... What's the Faces of Death movie? You know, it started out with them eating monkey brains, you know, bashing the monkey oh. over the head and eating the monkey brains yeah, and yeah. all these purported, you know, real live death scenes and stuff. And But there, if you go on YouTube, you can watch the, the guys that made the movie just laughing about it and showing how they faked everything. <laughs> I was also going to so, say, I looked up the, the population of Corona, New Mexico, and it's like 160-something people. I bet to this day they're pissed that they don't get credit for Roswell. It's like fucking, it's like you with your Kool Aid. It's fucking flavor aid. They're like fucking Corona. It wasn't Roswell. Seriously. Well, that Stanton Friedman's book about it. He 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 doesn't call it Roswell at all. He calls it the Corona incident. See, he's very, there you go. He's very yeah. specific about it. Yeah. yeah First live book. show we're gonna do in Corona, New Mexico, and Ian can eat at that uh, nearby uh, UFO McDonald's. <laughs> Isn't that one of your life goals? Yeah. Or is that over by... It's in Roswell. Is, it is. It's in Roswell, but it's in that area. So you, we can do a live show on Corona as a make good to them for not getting their just due. And then we'll go to Roswell and you can eat at your McDonald's. Yeah. From what I read online, Corona, there's a lot of meth activity going on out in Corona. Oh, that's weird. All the all the UFO stuff is <laughs> happening in Roswell. And then you, yeah. you leave Roswell and the surrounding areas is nothing but math. Yeah, they're dejected. <laughs> they got no credit for the weather balloon right. landing. Exactly. There. They're fucking pissed, exactly. dude. Yeah. Can you imagine if like the Cleveland Browns won a Super Bowl and then everyone was like, yeah, Akron won a Super Bowl. The Akron <laughs> Browns won. And then everyone in Cleveland's like, motherfucker. <laughs> We'd all become crackheads. Uh, I've been, I've been, Betty Hill. I've been to Roswell. It's an interesting place. I highly Did recommend you, you go McDonald's. through there. 
I don't think I did. I don't even know if we stopped. I, I think we just drove through. Yeah, probably best. But I remember lots, you know, lots of fucking gray alien, green and gray alien heads everywhere. So, Dave, you've been to Roswell and you've been to Point Pleasant, West Virginia, for the Mothman Museum. Which did you prefer? I mean, I guess you didn't stop in Roswell, but was Mount Pleasant uh, better? Point Pleasant? I mean, I think there might have been a lot of meth activity going on in Point Pleasant, West Virginia as well. <laughs> it just has that, you know, Ohio. Didn't you post the photos of like when you were driving through? Where was that at with like all the shady like RV UFO stuff? Where was that at? Do you remember what I'm talking about, though? Huh. Like the trailer park UFO stuff that you saw? Yeah, so it was like a UFO center. It was all spray painted. And oh, shit. no, that was, was super in South, shady. that was in South Carolina. <laughs> oh, OK. Yeah, that was a, the guy made a homemade uh, UFO in his front yard. And <laughs> it's a, it, check I, out. Yeah, I find on the tourist attraction, you know, the roadmap stuff. I'm like, all right, we got to fucking go here. Is. The UFO Welcome Center, Bowman, South Carolina. Bowman, go check yeah. out. We'll, we'll plug his Instagram again. Check out Dave underscore Namapod on Instagram. He posted it. It's not it's just a few posts back, back in September. And uh, this thing is fucking, the three of us could make a better UFO museum with our bare hands <laughs> than what this thing is. It was wild. I was waiting for the for the popo to roll up and ask me what I was doing there. I was sitting in an empty <laughs> lot across the street taking pictures of this trailer park. It wasn't even a trailer park. It was a guy, I guess his trailer was in the backyard and it was just this empty lot on the corner that had this UFO welcome it's, center. It's wild though. Like he literally just put up like spray painted white wooden panels that said UFO Welcome Center. Yeah, more or less. saucer parking <laughs> here. Yeah, yeah, more or less. Space people only. <laughs> and then this thing just looks like he took all like the duct tape and cardboard he could find to build this big UFO. There's like a fucking ladder in front of it. Oh, this is hilarious. Oh, I dare this. not. And you wonder go why inside. people laugh at America? No, I don't wonder at all. <laughs> Out of the three, I think I would go with, uh, I don't know. The Mothman Museum is, is pretty cool. Like, the statue's really cool. I was going to say. And, eh, it's neat. I mean, it's just one of those like downtrodden, you know, Ohio, West Virginia border towns along the river. But I don't know. It was nice. It was a cool spot. There it is. So I have nothing but good things to, to say about Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Boom. So according to the Majestic 12 documents, all that stuff was real. The UFO, the alien bodies, everything. And a secret team was sent out to recover the wreckage along with four alien bodies. And after going over everything, they realized the wreckage was not something we were capable of and the bodies weren't human. To keep this under control, after the RAAF announced a UFO had been recovered, President Truman created Majestic 12 to handle everything related to the crash. They were to report directly to him and no one else was to hear a word about it. Attached to this briefing was a classified executive order from President Truman authorizing Majestic 12, dated December 24th, 1947. So with Bill and Jamie sitting there like looking at this, there's no way that they could go public with these documents. If they were fake, it would ruin Bill's credibility in the UFO world. And then the, on the other hand, if they were real, they could potentially get in trouble for having highly classified documents. Like even faking something like this would get you in a lot of trouble with the FBI. So they decided to keep it quiet and they reached out to Stanton Friedman for help. Yeah, I think things were a lot different back then with, you know, having acts, having uh, in your possession classified documents. A little bit uh, different situation in the country. Or even like in the in the 70s when they who was it? Was it the Post or the New York Times that printed the Pentagon paper stuff that they they were going to that they charge? Did they charge them or they were going to charge them? I think at minimum they were threatened to be charged. Yeah, like it was a little different. But it's even worse back in the 40s. I mean, come on. So, yeah, I get the dilemma. So Stanton Friedman was the guy who broke the Roswell story wide open and, and brought it to the public light. Stanton was a nuclear physicist with top secret military clearance and would eventually fully believe in UFOs and become one of the top UFO researchers. At first glance, Stanton noticed that almost all of the names listed as being members of Majestic 12 were names that came up when he was digging into the Roswell subject. So Stan had credibility. He, he's pretty much exactly like J. Allen Hynek. You know, Hynek was brought on to work for Project Blue Book, yeah. and he was a skeptic, and then eventually he would end up believing in UFOs and Stan Freeman was the same. He was in, he, you know, he was working on some nuclear projects and stuff and something along the, along the way made him flip and believe in UFOs. 
Right. But I, I, I guess I mean he's not, you know, a, a Bubba in Mississippi hunting, you know, Bigfoot. <laughs> no. He's, no, no. He's, not <laughs> he's not a schmuck. You know, he's a nuclear physicist with top security military clearance. So he's not, you know, I just want to loop him into the, the wacko category that some of the people in this, this area get looped into, I guess. Right. He's a stand-up guy. So the names that were listed... Robert Montague, deputy commander at Fort Bliss, Texas, where the debris from Roswell were initially sent. So the weather balloon pieces, is that what you mean? Yep, all that that stuff. There's photos of all that online. (laughs) All that foil and and, uh, boxwood (laughs) and all that stuff. (laughs) It's all there. It adds. (laughs) Nathan Twining, he spoke to the press about Roswell right after the wreckage was found. James Forrestal, the secretary of defense. Gordon Gray, Assistant Secretary of the Army. Roscoe Hillencotter, at the time the current director of the CIA. Hoyt Vandenberg, previous director of the CIA. Sidney Sowers, another previous director of the CIA. And four high-level scientists who worked on military aircraft development. So if this would be true, all these people would make sense to be part of something like this. So either the names led lend a lot of legitimacy here. The person faking it knew, you know, knew what they were doing and knew what they were talking about and knew all the the primary players involved. And they would know exactly who would pique Stanton Friedman's interest. Yeah. The names for him to see. Mm -hmm. But the one name that stood out to Stanton was a guy named Donald Menzel. Menzel was an astrophysicist and one of the biggest skeptics of UFOs in the country. Menzel had written multiple books claiming to have debunked the UFO phenomena, so it did make sense that he would be involved in a cover-up regarding Roswell. Maybe that was his cover. He was a double, double, double agent. Double, triple, well, a triple, triple, a triple, double agent. A triple dog dare you agent. You can't triple stamp a double stamp. You can't triple stamp a double stamp. You can't triple stamp a double stamp. Fucking greatest comedy of all time, Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> It really is. I love that fucking movie. Name one better. So good. Name one better. I, I, I don't think I can. <laughs> Maybe Borat. I don't know. What? I mean, those, are, those, those are in my top. I think those are for sure in my top five. I think that's right. So Stanton went to the Library of Congress to do some further research into the MJ-12 papers. And he found a letter written to Donald Menzel from one of the scientists claimed to be on the MJ-12 team, Dr. Vannevar Bush. In the letter, Menzel was told the Air Force had cleared him of charges of disloyalty and he was allowed to keep his security clearance. The charges of disloyalty weren't weird to stand because during the McCarthy era, everyone was under investigation for communist ties. We talked about that back in our Albert Bender episode with how McCarthy was hammering all those UFO guys for potential communist ties and things like that oh yeah the house committee and on american activities that'd be a fun show to do one time like all those claims of communism and oh all that yeah kind of stuff. a lot to oh, dig yeah. in there. they accused everybody the red scare and all the blacklists and uh bobby kennedy worked on that committee for about six months and then he fucking quit because he was like you guys are out of your mind yeah always liked he always respected and looked up to joseph mccarthy though it's a punk yeah and that too, I watched that Dalton Trumbo movie not too long ago. He was one of the screenwriters that was uh, blacklisted in the 40s. Brian Cranston was in it. It's really good if you want a little background on how that whole blacklist stuff went down. It's an interesting what, story. What movie was it, did you say? Trumbo, about Dalton Trumbo, the screenwriter. He was one of the original 10 that were blacklisted in the 40s. Gotcha. The communist thing didn't shock him. But what was weird was that Donald Menzel would even have any type of military clearance in the first place. Stanton dug some more and found out that Donald Menzel had been doing classified intelligent work starting back in the 1930s. The plot thickens. That's interesting. Stanton found Menzel's file in the Harvard archives, and it had communications with President Kennedy regarding cryptography and breaking codes. So Stanton's first thought was that if the MJ-12 papers were real, Menzel might have been brought in to look at the weird symbols that were on the Roswell wreckage. Because remember... They said that there was like those pinkish purple like hieroglyphs on the side of of some of that stuff. Maybe it was just like weather markings like uh, hurricanes and it might tsunamis, be. <laughs> and atmospheric. Yeah. OK. <laughs> but what really got Stanton to start believing that this this could be real 
was when he found records of Menzel making numerous trips to Washington, D.C. and New Mexico in 1947. Okay, so at this point, we have some interesting corroborating evidence, I feel. You can connect a lot of dots here trying to prove that this document is real. In my opinion, at this stage in the story. That's There's all, a lot of that's smoke all I got to say. To yeah, it. a lot of smoke. <laughs> that's all I got to say about that. A lot of smoke. That's right. <laughs> His next step was to check out the dates on the MJ-12 documents. The executive order creating Majestic 12 was September 24th, 1947. According to President Truman's appointment book, he did meet with Dr. Vannevar Bush and Secretary of Defense James Forrestal. So that date could check out. Doesn't mean anything for sure, but he did meet with two of the people listed. The other date in question was November 18th, 1952, the day that the Majestic 12 briefing was given to President Eisenhower. Eisenhower was in Washington on that day for briefings, but there isn't anything concrete enough to say that Majestic 12 would have been part of those briefings. So I think we need to clarify here. So on that date, it was President-elect Eisenhower, so it would have been a transition memo to the transition team, I believe. So Correct. If, you, if yes. you look at it in that light, maybe, you know, you can say it was if it was important enough to provide to the transition team, maybe there's something to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when when Ian mentioned it earlier um, that he said it was an incoming memo for President Eisenhower that they initially discovered. So it was, yeah, just after he had won, you know, prior to taking office. Right. So at this point in in the investigation, stuff kind of hit a standstill. Like the names checked out. There's this weird thing with the Don- with Donald Menzel, but nothing was really happening. And then in March of 1985, Bill Moore received a postcard in the mail that was postmarked from New Zealand and had a return address to Ethiopia. On the back of this postcard, it had the following message, quote, when doors won't open, search for windows, add zest to your trip to Washington, try Reese's pieces for a stylish look, shop suit land. Oh, it's pretty cryptic, right? New Zealand, Imagine how fun it would be to be Bill Moore. Oh, yeah. This sounds like a fun little, uh, I don't know, what do you even call it? Treasure treasure hunt? Yeah, it's like right. the, the original national treasure. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Oddly, Stan Friedman had a meeting with a guy named Ed Reese who worked at the National Archives. Stop it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> And Ed tells him that the Air Force is in the process of declassifying a bunch of records from the late 1940s and early 1950s, and these records are going to be kept at a facility in Suitland, Maryland. Come on! The plot thickens here. It's all coming together. (laughs) It is. Everything's tying together. We'll be right back. In July of 1985, Jamie and Bill flew out to Suitland, Maryland to check out these declassified records. And after days of going through papers... They get to one memo that holds a bit of hope. The memo is from National Security Advisor Robert Cutler to Air Force General Nathan Twining, who was listed on the Majestic 12 papers and was the guy that spoke to the media about Roswell. It's a pretty routine memo about a meeting that needed to be rescheduled regarding the, quote, MJ-12 Studies Project. The memo doesn't specifically mention the name Majestic 12. It just says MJ-12, and it doesn't exactly say what MJ-12 is. Could it be Michael Jackson's 12 victims that we've never heard of yet? (laughs) It could be. Okay. If you you watch Square One, you might learn the truth. (laughs) Yeah, you'll learn that it didn't happen, Pally. You should watch it. (laughs) Educate yourself before you speak. You sound ignorant, man. (laughs) Just a mediocre white guy. That's what you are, Dave. I've never claimed to be anything different. (laughs) That's what we were called. That's why I brought that up. We were called that at one point. (laughs) Most truthful tweet we've ever gotten, ever received. Excuse me. Absolutely. (laughs) Without a doubt, 100% accurate. It's worth noting that the memo couldn't be taken from the archive, but a copy was allowed to be made, so it could be faked. Like they weren't allowed to actually take the original copy out from there. Mm. So it's possible. So I mean, it could be fake, but it's also easily confirmable by just another trip to the archives. But the person trying to confirm it also couldn't get a copy, so they could not prove it was, you know, you know what I mean? You're like in an <laughs> right. endless circle. And there. around and around we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
for the next two years, they go down every avenue possible to find reference to Majestic 12, and with no leads, they decided to go public in 1987. They sent out copies of the Majestic 12 papers and the Cutler Twining memo to every media outlet they could think of, along with a press release that said in part, quote, Although we are not in a position to endorse its authenticity at this time, it is our considered opinion that the document and its contents appear to be genuine. It sounds like the statement Mike's frat used to send out to respond to inquiries <laughs> about his coxmanship. <laughs> hey, it appeared to be genuine. That's all I needed to hear. Thanks, Pally. You don't have to endorse it. The story gained a ton of traction, and Stan Friedman ended up doing an interview with ABC Nightline with the New York Times and the Washington Post writing about the story. Three days after the release, the London Observer picked up the story and focused on the Cutler Twining memo. They spoke with the employee who had been helping Bill and Jamie at the archives in Maryland, and she confirmed to them that the memo was real and was found in the archives. But the London Observer pointed out the biggest issue with the memo, the fact that it wasn't signed. And this, at this point in the story, this brings us to Philip Class. Uh-oh, your buddy. Yeah. Uh-oh. The hero of the story <laughs> finally arrives. <laughs> Impeccable moral standard, that guy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Philip Class will kick some ass. <laughs> you know, if you listen to the Travis Walton episode that we did, the Fire in the Sky one, Philip Class is one of the most vocal, or was one of the most vocal people against UFOs in the country at the time. And my biggest issue with him and everybody else that, you know, is interested in UFOs and stuff is that he would per use personal attacks against people, like stuff that had absolutely nothing to do with the UFOs and would just try to destroy people's credibility very publicly. And he specifically had it out for Stan Friedman. Mm. Actually, earlier today, I was watching the interview on ABC Nightline. It was Stan. It was basically a debate of, with Stan Friedman versus Philip Class. <laughs> it's absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> but, and it was as coherent as the, the last two Biden Trump debates. Which is yeah. two people yelling at each other. Come on, man. Shut up, man. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, every time Stan starts talking, bringing up something, uh, you hear Philip Class in the background saying it's nonsense and stuff, and <laughs> it's just ridiculous. Yep. And incidentally, Philip Class, you, we, we, you know, like you said, we mentioned him first in like Fire in the Sky with Travis Walton. That was the one UFO story where, where the three of us agreed that we believed that something happened, right? I believe that story, yeah. Yeah, like, I, I mean, and I don't remember to a T if we believed every single thing, but we believe they did experience something odd, something, you know, something different that night. And it's just crazy that that's where Philip Class comes in. The one the one thing we all agree on. And this guy's like, no, fuck you. Yeah, yeah he made it his life. Like, he really had it out for Stan Friedman. But then when the fire in the sky stuff happened, he kind of made it his life work to... To credit or disprove those guys and went to really yeah. personal lengths to just to normal normal everyday like hardworking citizens that had this experience and uh and then he just goes after him philip class really he, he seems like a guy that might have got abducted by aliens and got the the barney hill treatment and he's real mad about it oh wow <laughs> interesting <laughs> Tell you what, if I was Barney Hill, I'd be out for revenge, too. <laughs> Snazzy dresser, though. That man looked good. That's true. What was the name of his what dog? What was the dog's Mike? name? What was the dog's name? <laughs> what did you say, Dave? You beat me I'm to sorry. it. I was going to ask you what the dog's name was. It's uh, It starts with a D. D You're on the right track. Yeah, you got it. D ah, fuck. What is it? It's a wiener dog. Delcy. Delcy. I was going to say <laughs> Dotsy. Delcy. <laughs> Yeah, because we, we got the photo of like the, the family picture of the two of them with Delcy on their lap. <laughs> <laughs> so Philip Class starts to point out flaws in the Majestic 12 documents and the Cutler twining memo. In the Majestic 12 briefing, the date is formatted as day, month, comma, year. But the standard for government documents at the time was month, day, comma, year. Mm. So overseas, they do it day, month. So does that lead us to believe that someone overseas was faking this? Well, but Dave, overseas, they do everything wrong with the fucking metric system. Come on, get it together. <laughs> Dumbasses. Is that, is that right? <laughs> do it our way. Come on. So I, I, I have a question. Uh, sure. Steel cage, barbed wire, death match, Friedman or class? Who would win? Yeah. 
who was the more physically imposing man? Uh, you know, probably. if that even makes sense in the UFO community. <laughs> I guess, I guess Philip Glass, he's extremely hostile, man. If there you, you ever watch right. any of his interviews, he's always so goddamn angry. That's why I said he, I think he got the Barney Hill treatment. He's just really mad about it and is out there trying to discredit aliens. Mm. He's very angry all the time. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I'm looking was. at pictures. Philip Glass looks angry. Stanton Friedman uh, does not look like he would be a tough individual. He's a nuclear physicist. <laughs> no, he'd be very, he'd outsmart you, maybe. Maybe that's yeah. the thing. He'll outsmart you into like hurting yourself. Well, class I mean, is an astrophysicist. That's true, too. Is a steel cage, uh, can you have a barbed wire steel cage death match? I don't want these wrestling guys to be attacking me like I'm, a, I'm an imbecile on Monday morning. Yes, I'm pretty sure that happens in Japan <laughs> weekly, Dave. I'll, t- I'll take the heat on that. They do all kinds of that. They're actually, WWE did a, a barbed wire steel cage match. All right. Um, this is going to be a little embarrassing, but it was in February 2004, the No Way Out pay-per-view. <laughs> John Bradshaw Layfield. Uh, I'm sorry, February 2005, not 2004. Oh, 2005. Well, easy mistake. I know. <laughs> oh, sorry. John Bradshaw Layfield defended the WWE Championship against the Big Show in a barbed wire steel cage match. It was not a death match, though, Dave, so apologies. Okay. That's a good look into the the three of us hanging out. (laughs) Because when we were watching wrestling, I can say like, oh, yeah, remember that one match with, I don't know, just come up with two random wrestlers and you'd be like, oh, yeah, give me the exact date, year, the location, where it was, the the attendance, (laughs) the pay-per-view buy rate. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Yeah. That's, I think, the one and only barbed wire cage match in WWE history. Thanks for clarifying. Mm Mm-hmm. So Class went on to say that the signature by Harry Truman on the Majestic 12 briefing was too perfect. He claimed that it was photocopied from a specific letter that Truman sent in 1947. He might be right. He's probably right. I'll go ahead and say that now. He's probably right that it was photocopied. But it's not the one that he was talking about because you can clearly see the differences when he put them side by side. It's not the same signature. Mm. But I think he's correct in the photocopying, and we'll get into that later. Okay. But that's fair. He, it just, this just seemed like him being an asshole to be in one of his things of just being an asshole to be an asshole on the signature thing. In the Cutler Twining memo, Class said that the typeface was wrong. It was typed out in a larger font called Pika, and he said all the documents from Cutler's office use a smaller font called Elite. He went as far as to put out a public challenge to Stanton Friedman that he would give Stanton $100 for every memo from Cutler's office that used the Pika font, and Stanton ended up finding 34 of them. God damn. This is something that these two would do back and forth each other. Like These really petty things. Class would always put up this stuff like, well, I'll give you this much money mm. if you uh, can prove this, and Stanton would be like, all right, fucko here, and would prove it to him. <laughs> and It's just this back and forth thing. It's so do weird. Do you think... Do you think that they actually like kind of grew like a respect and like a, a friendly rivalry for each other? Or do you think they legit hated each other? No, I don't think Philip Class liked anybody. Mm. He seems like a guy that did not have any <laughs> friends in life. <laughs> he seems like such an asshole. Poor guy. Sounds to me like Class is dismissed. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> That's the happiest I've been in at least a decade. <laughs> the biggest issue with these documents that Stanton, Bill Moore, and, and Jamie don't have an explanation for is that the Majestic 12 briefing refers to Roscoe Hill and Cotter as Admiral when his rank was actually Rear Admiral. And these are these ranks are a huge difference. I mean, yeah. we're talking, you know, four-star general versus like a one or two-star. Right. The author is claimed to be Roscoe Hillencotter, so you would have to then believe that Hillencotter got his own rank wrong in writing these, and that just doesn't make any sense at all. Maybe he's just trying to give himself a promotion. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> Could be. I guess so. <laughs> We're just speculating here. We don't know. I mean, like what? They called Mike the Coxman. Right? Maybe he called himself <laughs> Coxman General or something. He just tried to uh, embell- I was, well, embellish I was a, a little bit. I was a, I was a four-star coxman, not just a cox. Four-star. <laughs> graduated second in my class. You graduated magna cum loudly, right? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> graduated make them come loudly. <laughs> 
I was the valedictorian. <laughs> We're here all night, folks. <laughs> try the Come v- back next week. Try the veal. We'll be here all week. <laughs> Join Patreon. Plenty more of these jokes. <laughs> <laughs> All this petty fighting that started going on, because we didn't really talk about it um, or haven't talked about it yet. But these documents, and we'll, I'll bring it up later, too. But the, the Majestic 12 documents, they really divide the UFO community. They, these are like one of the most controversial subjects in, the, in, in UFO lore. This petty fighting between Stan Friedman and philip class and then there's other all this other side fighting going on about this stuff it could have easily been solved by the fbi regarding these these documents but they were silent on the majestic 12 papers for over a year the fbi was eventually asked by the air force office of special investigations to look at the majestic 12 documents the agent in charge of the mj12 documents had never heard of Majestic 12, but there was some other classified information mentioned in them, so he just assumed that they were real. A month later, the FBI issued a memo saying the Air Force OSI had now advised them to close the investigations and that the documents were fake. A few years later, another FBI agent came across the Majestic 12 papers, so he reached out to the Department of Defense, because when this agent came across, he was like, what the fuck is this? What am I even looking at right now? So he contacts the Department of Defense. They didn't know what it was either, but there's some info that the in the documents that is accurate. So again, the FBI launched a second investigation. This time, the Air Force OSI completely ignored the FBI, and the investigation went nowhere. Mm. You guys know I used to work for the Department of Defense? Oh, yeah? That's, I did know that. That's true. <laughs> I wasn't involved in any of this, though. <laughs> no, no joke needed. That was just a humble brag by day. I'm just... Throwing it out there. Oh, you really did? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Years and years ago. He gave up that job, and now he serves you sandwiches at Subway. So, you know. <laughs> He's a giver, though. He's a giver. <laughs> I swept the floors at Area 51. That's what I did. <laughs> I got lots of knowledge I can't talk about, though. That was me on the Art Bell tape flying. I was flying, yeah, my, I was gonna say, flying my plane in there. <laughs> Dave's the one who gave that guy the inside information. He flew his plane over Area 51 <laughs> in the single greatest Art Bell call of all time. God, we we did Art Bell back on Halloween. I already missed it. I want to do another fucking Art Bell show. <laughs> I have so much fun with those. That's a good time. The FBI would then eventually release the file on Majestic 12 in December of 1993 with the word bogus written over every page of it. Well, that's bold. So it's weird, and this uh, this will come up in a little bit here, but that the Air Force OSI is basically stonewalling the FBI on anything regarding these papers, any investigation into them. It just kind of dies out. Mm. The FBI releasing this and writing bogus on everything, you know, it obviously fuels people in the UFO world that believe in these papers. And then a year or two after this, we talk, And we talked about it in, in our Roswell episode. The Air Force released their report on Roswell and called it Case Closed. And in that, they claimed that it, it was a weather balloon and that it was something called Project Mogul, which pissed everybody in the UFO community off even more. Because after all this time with Roswell, and there were some congressmen at the time pushing for them to, to just release the stuff on Roswell, the Air Force basically just came out and doubled down on the whole weather balloon story <laughs> and then the air force didn't stop after that that they, they, they said that was prod that was case closed and then a couple years after that they released another report on the aspect of the bodies like it, it was weird they just kept bringing it up mm-hmm. instead of just letting it go yeah they just kept fueling the fire on on roswell bringing it up but not actually providing anything worth you know with substance right because project mogul was the it was the weather. It was a weather balloon project, but it was like a, like a souped up weather balloon that they had microphones attached to it, and the the plan was to get it high enough to where they could hear uh, if the Soviet Union was testing nuclear weapons. Mm-hmm. Makes perfect sense to me. This debate on whether or not the Majestic Twelve documents were real or not went on in the UFO community for years, and then in 2007 there was kind of a break in the case. There's a guy in the UFO world named Bob Pratt. And he worked with Bill Moore a lot in the 1980s. Bob had a habit of recording conversations to go back for reference. 
And some of these recordings were of conversations between Bill Moore and Air Force OSI Special Agent Richard Doty. Bill had this been guy's spe- an individual. He's something, man. He, uh, you know, we're going to talk about him here for about a page and a half or so. But Richard Doty deserves a, an episode on a, just a whole Richard Doty episode because the stuff that this guy is involved in is crazy. Bill had been speaking with Richard Doty since 1980 and had set up a deal where Bill would tell Richard Doty what was going on with the Roswell investigation and in UFO groups. And in return, the Air Force would provide Bill with credible UFO information. In December of 1981, Richard Doty told Bill that all of the knowledge about UFOs was compiled into a briefing in 1952, and that briefing was given to incoming President Eisenhower. So let's get into Richard Doty a bit. He's easily one of the most controversial figures in the UFO world. He had a 20-year career in the Air Force with several of those years spent in OSI as an intelligence agent. Mike, you watched the Mirage Men yesterday, right? I did. A couple days ago, actually. It's an interesting documentary on uh, Richard Doty. It is extremely interesting. <clears throat> I actually, I wasn't able to finish it. I had a you know, I couldn't, I had to, I don't know, whatever, get to other stuff, but I had like a half hour left of it, but I watched the bulk of it and it was just uh, pretty crazy how he's just like, uh, yeah, I lied to everybody for, you know, all this time and, <laughs> right, right. you know, misled people uh, all throughout the UFO community and, you know, but, hey, whatever. I'm just like, you know, everyone else on the street. <laughs> What's that? At, uh, Amazon Prime right now, right? If anyone wants to watch that. Mirage Men. It is on Amazon it's Prime good. called Mirage Men. It's interesting. You might have to search. Like, there's a few movies called Mirage Men as well. So make sure you're finding the one from, like, 2013. Because this is like a, it's an actual documentary. It's not a movie. The guy that made the documentary also wrote a book on it. called, And it's called Mirage Men, too. It's it's really detailed. It goes into a lot more detail on uh mm on some of that stuff that, that Richard Doty was up to. Back when he was in the Air Force, Doty was stationed at Kirtland Air Force Base in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and claims that he was assigned the task of spreading disinformation within the UFO community, specifically forging documents and infiltrating UFO groups. The reasoning for this, according to him, was to hide classified projects the military was working on and to find out if Soviet agents had infiltrated any UFO groups. Doty's story has changed multiple times over the years since he has retired from the military. And a lot of the stuff that he says is contradictory, which I personally think that he does it on purpose. The Air Force also refuses to publicly address anything regarding Richard Doty. Why would they, right? Like, yeah, Yeah. we we don't know that guy. I don't know. Especially what we're about to get into (laughs) here in a second. (laughs) He just just loves fucking with people, that guy. He might still be on the job. Yeah, and that's the thing about him that uh, that that irks me about him. It's not like I, I get it if he was if he was assigned these jobs, that's his job. I get it, but in civilian life, there's evidence that he continues to do it, and it seems like he does it just for the hell of it with some things. And yeah. it's like, all right, man, so what's the end game now? What, what do you just like fucking with people or what? All right, Doty's role in the UFO world started with a guy named Paul Benowitz who owned a humidity equipment company that had contracts with Kirtland Air Force Base. His house and office were near Kirtland, and he believed that he was seeing UFOs over part of the base that housed nuclear weapons. He also believed that he was receiving transmissions from aliens that flew those UFOs. He was out there videotaping lights that he was seeing over the base and things like that. The Air Force sent out Richard Doty to investigate, but OSI decided that further investigation was unwarranted. Paul Benowitz wasn't given giving this up, and a few days later, he was allowed to present his evidence to some officers and scientists at the base. Paul wanted a grant to conduct more research, and one of the scientists said that he would help Paul f- fill out that paperwork for a grant. Freedom of Information Act documents that were released state that two U.S. senators from New Mexico had called or shown up to Kirtland to check on OSI's investigation of Paul Benowitz and his claims of alien contact. Apparently, Paul Benowitz had requested their help, and both times the senators were told that there was no investigation. Doty claims what the senators were told was not true. Doty says he was told to make Paul Benowitz believe that there was an impending alien invasion because Benowitz was actually observing secret Air Force projects. 
according to Doty, the Air Force wanted to discredit Paul Benowitz, so no one would figure that out. However, Doty claims that in doing so, he created hoax documents that were given to Paul Benowitz and other UFO researchers, and that he broke into Paul's house and office. It, it, it's really hard to figure out what's true in this story with Doty and Benowitz. There's just so yeah, much. There's so much. Yeah, disinformation so much, floating around. It, Exactly. That's what I was going to say. I also do find it hard to believe that um, would the Air Force really be be running secret projects so close to like civilian homes to like where they could just see it out their windows like Benowitz was doing? That seems kind of odd to me that they would even put themselves in a situation where that civilians could see all this. One of the things that Paul Benowitz drew that he saw because this is back in the 80s. One of the things that he drew from back then sure as hell looks like a modern day drone from today. Mm. So I'm wondering if some of this that he that he had seen was them testing drones, because back in the 80s, they would definitely not want anybody to know about the drones that we have today. Any testing of that. And so I would so assume. My, yeah, and string but why it, would why would they be testing them so close to like resident residential homes where he can just like see them from like his porch? That's just what I think to me is weird. Like if it's so top secret, why are people even living anywhere near this area well, where they're but testing it? That was Kirtland Air Force Base, right? Like in Albuquerque. That's where ben, yeah. by where Benowitz lived. I mean, you know, there's not that many remote places. I mean, even Area 51 is so far out in the fucking desert, but people still go there and they witness things going on there. I mean, I guess, but I mean, if you're if you're going to be that secretive about it, I, I don't think you're going to be doing it right where people can see it from their front lawn. Well, and that's one of Doty's reasonings for why he he and other people would infiltrate UFO groups was because a lot of these guys in MUFON and things like that were hanging out around these bases close enough to potentially see something. And they wanted to know if any Soviet people had infiltrated some of these groups potentially. I mean, the logic makes sense. So I'm, I'm this guy. I see, you know, drones being tested at the Air Force Base. I'm like, I, you know, I don't know what a drone is. So I, I, my mind immediately goes to, you know, UFOs or whatnot. So the, the Air Force says, hey, go out and fuck with this guy. Tell him, yeah, you're on the track of UFOs and just lead him off in another direction. So they think that, you know, there's a UFO cover up and whatnot. And it, it kind of obscures, you know, the military hardware or whatever they're actually testing. I and mean, it makes sense. It's logical. I agree. I think that does make sense. Like, you know, that it absolutely could be drones. And back in this day, you would think they're UFOs. I don't know. I just feel like if the government wants to secretly test something, they can do it without anybody being aware. I don't know that that's true. I don't think that's true, though. I don't think that's true. I I mean, we're not in Siberia. There's not. I mean, you know, Area 51 is a pretty remote location and people can see in Vegas what's going on in Area 51 sometimes. I guess that gets to a whole bigger argument of I feel like there's probably a whole lot of land and area and stuff that we don't even know about. But that's probably a whole nother thing. I mean, the federal government owns what, like 90 percent of the state of Nevada? Well, they have it, but people mm. still end up seeing it. I don't know. I'm just saying if it's that top secret of a, of a thing, I feel like the government wouldn't mm. be this sloppy. Mm. But yeah, again, I don't, I don't know where that I don't know where that plays out in this story because I don't know what the fuck is true and what isn't in this story. <laughs> yeah, right. It's it's hard. So to, I don't even yeah. know. I don't even know if my point is relevant because who the fuck knows? But if people see, you know, your test stuff and the disinformation stuff to get them off the trail makes sense to me. It's what I would do. Yeah, that absolutely does. I, I do agree with that. That does make sense. Well, and the thing with Paul is that they end up feeding or Richard Doty specifically ends up feeding all this stuff into his head about. Everything that he comes to them is true. So and Paul would come back with, you know, he, he got some audio recordings and he's like, this this has to be the, you know, th- this is the UFOs. And they're like, well, shit, he's, he's tapped in. He caught some audio recording of something else. So they ramp it up even further on him and they end up taking him out, like flying over over the Dulce area where that in that in itself, you know, Paul ends up claiming that he sees UFOs coming out of the mountains out there. And that's a whole other episode. That's a full Sunday episode is the Dulce base Mm -hmm. UFO conspiracy theory on what's going on out there. And that all stems from from this, from Paul Benowitz and the disinformation that Richard Doty was feeding him. I mean, that guy lost his business. He he, that guy took a big hit. Yeah. Yeah. Because 
the the Freedom of Information Act request, it is confirmed 100% that, that Richard Doty did give Paul Benowitz documents that would make him believe he was under investigation, even though Doty told senators that this was not the case. And like you just said, Dave, they lost everything. Paul Benowitz eventually was checked into a mental health facility due to paranoia. I mean, he just yeah completely went crazy over this. They fucked with them so much. Yeah. They, and I, they I really did. That, yeah. I, and I, there's a there's a quote from the guy that wrote the book Mirage Man and then did the, the and did the documentary where he says that Paul was a patriotic guy. He was on the Air Force's side. They he worked with them. He had contracts with them. They were business partners. If he really saw something, he, they could have just said, "Hey, Paul, don't talk about that. Like, get rid of that video and get rid of anything else, and just don't don't bring it up." And he he would have done that. I think this was truly to just figure out if a disinformation campaign would work mm-hmm. in the, regarding UFOs. Hey, let's just ruin someone's fucking life just to see if it works. Because then you find out that the NSA is actually involved doing a whole side thing on Paul that has nothing to do with Richard Doty. Tra- they're sending him messages onto his computer. And Bill Moore was involved in breaking into Paul's house, planning things onto his computer. Bill Moore was directly involved in that, too? Bill Moore had, had, has admitted that he was involved with Richard Doty breaking into Paul Benowitz's house, planning things. Mm. That's and, a whole other level there. And Bill Moore said that he did it in the promise that he would be given true UFO information. Mm. What about other people who were in this area that might have just been normal civilians? Were they ever making reports of seeing stuff that we know of? Or was it just Benowitz? I don't know. I think the thing you always hear about out in around Area 51 or places in New Mexico around these Air Force bases, you know, people would call into Art Bell all the time or I know George Knapp has said, you know, talking to people, everyone's like, yeah, everybody sees some weird stuff every once in a while out in New Mexico. So it just becomes a part of everyday life. Yeah. Yeah. Living in the Southwest is just a given. You see some weird stuff. No. I think it was George Knapp, now that I'm thinking about it more, said something like, yeah, you see weird lights all, you know, every once in a while you see some weird lights out in New Mexico. Richard Doty claims that he had nothing to do with the Majestic 12 documents and that he was investigated and cleared of having any involvement. However, Richard Doty has had has been proven to have his hand in multiple disinformation campaigns, including one against Art Bell's favorite guest, Linda Moulton Howe. Spreading the information about Project Serpo, which we'll do an episode on that one day. What was done to Paul Benowitz, and more importantly for this story, years-long information exchanges with Bill Moore. I think there's no coincidence that Richard Doty and Bill Moore set up this plan to share information. Mm. That's amazing. Richard Doty's, that's true, yeah. Richard Doty's life story is about as incredible as like a Wikipedia page. <laughs> Like just anything can get thrown in there. You don't really know what's true and what isn't. You kind of filter through it and take it for what it's worth. So what's the idea, though? Is Moore and Doty in cahoots from the from the beginning or did that original movie idea touch a nerve somewhere with the Air Force? And, you know, they sent Doty out with this whole substantial misinformation campaign from day one. There's a lot of people that believe that Bill Moore was a genuine person and he just had this idea that for whatever reason, he was the chosen one, you know, that the Air Force would actually give him the information. So he played along with them in that they really wanted to know about what he was doing with the Roswell stuff. But more importantly, they wanted to know what was going on in those UFO groups like MUFON and stuff like that. Sure. And then maybe this this movie thing that he was doing with Jamie Shandera did strike a nerve. Because Richard Doty would have 100% known about that movie idea. He was in very close contact with with Bill Moore. And the way, like when you dig into Richard Doty a bit and see how he plays these games with people, especially that that postcard that was talking about the Reese's Pieces thing. Yeah, right, right, right. That has Richard Doty all over it. That's interesting. And the kind of... That uh, that, that, that postcard gave them everything they needed, like spelled it out. Yeah, like just the subterfuge and the uh, you know envelope within an envelope and the envelope like oh this must be top secret it's hidden in three envelopes right. you know that that's got his name written all over it yeah I'm not buying this at all 
it, you know, and unfortunately, there there are a ton of people in the UFO community that believe that the Majestic Twelve papers are one hundred percent real, and Stan Friedman is included in that. Mm. He died thinking that those were one hundred percent real. Refused to believe that Richard Doty had anything to do with it. Did he give any specific reasons, like what his what his big rationale for that coming to that conclusion was? I think it's just with the UFO thing, it gets so goddamn confusing sometimes that it, you could, I guess you could like kind of, I don't know what they call it in, um, like yes anding yourself. Like you could talk yeah. yourself into. It's like they work into themselves being like, into a shoot sometimes, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> like they don't know. They, <laughs> to get some wrestling speak again. Like they don't know what the fuck's real and what's not anymore. Like they, they just, they, they pull so much wool over people's eyes that it's like, well, wait a minute, where the fuck is the actual truth? Yeah. And I think people even on the inside don't even know. I, I think that's what it does with, with stuff with like r- what Richard Doty does and what, what some of this other disinformation stuff has done is it's like you don't know what the truth is anymore with UFO stories. <laughs> that's the whole idea, though. Yeah. And if you if you want to believe Richard Doty, which I don't believe anything that the guy says, but if you. If you believe what he says, he says 80% of it is disinformation, 20% is real, and the 20% that's real is the craziest shit. The craziest stuff that you hear about is the stuff that's real, according to him. Which Mm. just makes me think, like, how much shit is actually out there then? You know, like the government knows about or the military knows about. If the craziest stuff is real, then there's got to be a whole ton of stuff that we aren't necessarily aware of that is actually that actually exists and this is where you get into the whole thing that's going on recently with tom DeLong from blink 182 because you you like when i first saw that all that stuff with him i'm like what the fuck what like really tom DeLong from blink 182 (laughs) this makes no sense at all you know when wikileaks dropped all the all of john podesta's emails was that like 2016 maybe something like that that was the first word of any of that is Oh, it's like, wait, what the fuck is this? There's a bunch of emails in here of John Podesta and Tom DeLong talking about UFOs. <laughs> right. And then I and believe then, in those emails, they did confirm that all the small things was not written about me. It's I never heard that confirmed. <laughs> well, you better check WikiLeaks, Pally. <laughs> and then you see how how like gung ho Tom DeLong is, and there's then he starts getting these other credible people around him, like really really credible people. I know George Knapp wrote an article about it and had voiced his concern and stuff is like, is Tom DeLonge getting the Paul Benowitz treatment here or was he in the process of it? And then, and then the WikiLeaks thing exposed it. So it didn't go any further. Now they, it obviously has gone further because he's still doing it and those people are still working with him and they, you know, have the, that documentary just came out and some different things, but that was the first thing that, George Knapp brought up is like, wait, is Tom DeLong getting the the Paul Benowitz treatment here? Are they just stringing him along? It's weird. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Mm. I like that new show though; it's really funny. They were having, uh, giving like all these really, really credible, high level people, like the the History Channel guy voice, and then it, and you keep seeing like the table, and they're showing it, and you see Tom DeLong sitting there the whole time, and they don't say anything about him. I'm like, are they really just gonna fucking ignore Tom DeLong? <laughs> which one? Show, like, which one's say that? Anything the, with? the phenomenon one? Uh, no, it's called Unidentified. It's this new. It's oh, like okay. a, It's a new show with him with them, his whole group. Right. And I'm like, are they really just gonna fucking ignore him? <laughs> and at the end, in the History Channel guy voice, it's like, and led by their their unlikely leader, Blink One Eighty Two guitarist Tom DeLong. <laughs> <laughs> like, Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> what do we gotta do to get Tom DeLong on this show for an interview? Uh, it'd be cool. Ask him about UFOs. Yeah, that's what I mean. Right. We'll do a whole show like. Dave and I will just sit here and drink beer and look at pictures of Casey Anthony and Ian and him can nerd out for two hours <laughs> and talk and we'll fucking get ratings. I we'll mean, get downloads. Mike, if you take off your pants and jacket, he'll probably come on. <laughs> oh, gladly. <laughs> gladly. On video, I'll do it. Not even for patrons, just for any listener and for Tom DeLong. I'll take off my pants and jacket and then look at pictures of Casey Anthony. So it's fitting. Who is one of four in the poll for the uh, first show of 2021? Great choice, in my opinion. Hey, Casey Anthony, Israel Keys, uh, who? Uh, West Memphis 3, and um, who's the last one? Leonard Lake, Charles Eng. Leonard Lake, Charles Eng. 
four of the most popular, uh, popularly requested topics. So we put them all out there. And, you know, we'll get to this again at the end of the wrap-up. We're going to cover all of them at some point, but it's just which one do you want to hear right away in January? Go vote at uh, Necronomapod.com. Anyways, back to this. Two other things I wanted to bring up real quick before we wrap it up is, um, you know, I said that one of the the campaigns was against one of Art's favorite guests, Linda Moulton Howe. She was on there all the time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She's yeah. I, I like listening to her. Mm-hmm. I think she's another one that fully believes the Majestic Twelve. Okay. Paper. She's she does some really good work, but I think she's very gullible at times too. But um, you know, she was in the, at the time at back in the eighties, early nineties. She was doing a documentary like, or you know, trying to break the case open on cattle mutilations. And according to Richard Doty, she had struck a nerve with the government on that, and that's why they they started a campaign against her and fed, and he fed her all kind of bullshit mm. according to her and him. I mean, he confirms it, that he showed her documents about how aliens created us, that we were a product of aliens kind of harvesting earth and like modifying DNA and things like that. You know, there's that whole theory out there with like the ancient alien stuff. And he forged documents and showed those to Linda Howe. Interesting. She bought Guy's it. Got his, she 100 percent she took it on our bell show and talked about it yep yeah he's got it he literally has his hand in like almost every every type of lore you can think of Mm. see he somehow has his hand in it spreading some form of disinformation yeah Mm. there's the whole thing with harry truman you know supposedly harry truman had signed a treaty with aliens way back in the 40s (laughs) <laughs> allowing them to do the abductions and really the, like the yeah the, to to do the abductions and and do testings i have not heard that one before that's a that's yeah. a new little tidbit that's got that's a tre- got a treaty with aliens <laughs> a treaty with the grays wow uh speaking of you know i know we, we've done a lot of presidential talk tonight but whatever it's uh it's a forte of ours other than you know i'm more than just pro wrestling folks but um <laughs> an interesting note so it, while he was campaigning for the governor of Georgia in 1969, Jimmy Carter uh, alleged to have seen a UFO uh, somewhere down in uh, sm- a small town in Georgia when he was out, like, you know, kind of meeting folks. And in 1973, when he was actually in office, he, he had ma- he had reported it to people. It was kind of like a little bit of a thing, but nothing major. In 1973, while he was the governor, NASA contacted him and sent him this questionnaire. And most of his advisors were like, yeah, throw this the fuck out. Like, this is ridiculous. We don't need to stand out by this. But in 73, Carter knew he was going to be running for president in 76. And he knew there was a strong fo- <clears throat> a strong following in the alien community. So he thought, hey, this might be good for votes. Yeah, I'm going to double down on this. He filled out their questionnaire, explained exactly what he he, uh, saw that night, what he thought he saw or, you know, what his experience was, filled it out, sent it back to them and, you know, did it as a way because in that era, they thought that was a good way to get votes was to kind of uh, play into that uh, UFO sighting, uh, you know, population. So he did that. Mm -hmm. It turns out in 2016, they discovered that about 250 kilometers away from where Jimmy Carter was that night in Florida, they had launched a barium cloud up in the space. And that's probably what he saw that night. So he wasn't making it up. He did see something, but it was a barium cloud. What's a barium cloud on top. So I looked it up actually, and then I did not write it down. So give me one second. (laughs) <laughs> barium cloud barium cloud is used to study the motion of both ions and neutrals in space mm. so science people can figure that out but either way Same. that's what it was so then on top of that in 1970 when ronald reagan was governor of california as his aircraft was landing in California, he alleged to have seen a UFO outside of the plane window and uh, apparently ordered his pilot to follow it because he wanted to know what it was. Uh, again, this was a time when uh, politicians thought it was you know, good for votes to, to have seen UFOs or just to kind of connect to that community because they thought it would be good for, uh, mm. you know, for their standing. So Jimmy Carter in 69 and uh, Ronald Reagan in 1970. 
both had a alleged UFO sightings. I seem to recall a story about Carter promising to spill the beans on UFOs once he was in office, too, and then he, crying. It's true. He yeah, cry. did. And then when he got in office, he he was uh, allegedly found out that it would it would spill a lot of national you know high security secrets yeah, right. and never really touched right. on the matter again, much to the dismay of the UFO community. Exactly right. Yeah. Yes. So that in and of itself is a uh, it's quite a story. Yeah. Jimmy Carter really did, you know, claim Jimmy Carter, his reputation's always been an honest guy. He doesn't, you know, there, there's not a whole lot of, uh, yeah. you know, scandal with Jimmy Carter. He, he alleged to see, have seen a UFO, describes what he saw in Georgia that night. And it turns out there was something, you know, launching into space that night that they said met the criteria of what he could have seen. So right. he was honest about his. I, I don't know much about Ronald Reagan's. I haven't dove into that as much. But, um, you know, so that, from that point forward, Jimmy Carter you know, said he was going to release all the information. But I think, you know, that's a that's a great promise. But once you get to the uh, the White House, I feel like, yeah. you know, there is a lot of national security you have to consider. Probably the guy that Tom DeLong works with. That's part of his team. I don't remember his exact title off the top of my head, but he's like one of the top of the top intelligence guys for the Defense Department during like 9-11. Like this guy is no... Uh, no just standard government employee or anything this guy is like a really high level guy named christopher mellon it, it, it was kind of his opinion was like the same thing that i kind of thought for a long time is that they just the government really doesn't know what ufos are so that's why they don't admit anything mm -hmm. he was saying if there is something like crashed stuff from roswell or something that it it would be hidden behind it's hidden behind a huge layer of black ops projects and stuff that even presidents don't have the access to that kind of stuff. I don't doubt it. Yeah. If that's, if that part of it's real, that's his opinion. I think that makes sense. Like just some of the stuff just gets so diluted with, you know, what's, what's top secret, what's real, what isn't real, what's disinformation, it, you know, who the fuck knows. And then I when know. you get to the point of like, what, when we're questioning what even the president might know, well then of course, <laughs> none of us schmucks are going to fucking know. <laughs> I know I've been I've been going really hard on aliens recently getting ready for this one like behind doing Fred and Rose West I was I watched a bunch of that Tom DeLonge's show and I watched that documentary phenomenon and stuff and then I started doing all the Richard Doty stuff and by the end of reading about Richard Doty and all this stuff I'm like well, I'm now I'm just fucking confused I don't know what's real what's not anymore <laughs> I don't know what to believe like I start believing that you know I'm I'm th I'm going along the line of J. Allen Hynek and Jacques Vallée that it's interdimensional and then Tom DeLonge's people start convincing me that maybe they are physical and then Richard Doty just confuses everything and I'm like oh, fuck I don't know I don't know what to believe anymore <laughs> which, is, which is exactly what Richard Doty was sent here to do exactly That's, like he literally did what he was supposed to do confuse the fuck out of everyone yeah. I don't know this was a fun conversation tonight I think kind of some good stuff sure we did Ian, any uh, final, final thoughts? I know we kind of closed up there for about a half hour, but you got any final thoughts on this one? No, it's fun to get back into aliens and and read about all this stuff again. I mean, we touched on a, a handful of full Sunday episodes in this one <laughs> with all the, the bullshit that Richard <laughs> Doty Project had Serpo. Abandoned. Yeah. Um, that one's really interesting and man if anybody watches that documentary Mirage Man stuff I, I feel really bad for the guy that runs the Project Serpo website because he just refuses to believe that he was duped by Richard mm -hmm. Doty uh, Dave you got anything else on uh, this one no I have nothing good good fun topic though yeah I agree I don't either but as we said earlier I will remind everyone that you can vote on the first topic of 2021 that we cover on Necronomapod.com. There is Leonard Lake and Charles Ng, Casey Anthony, the West Memphis Three, and Israel Keys. Those are the four probably most requested topics we have. You guys can vote right now at Necronomapod.com on which one you want us to cover in January. While you're at Necronomapod.com, check out our merch page. We still have Black Friday sales going on on stickers and koozies, so be sure to pick up some of those. If you want our authentic merchandise, 
amazon.com slash necronama or amazon.com and then search necronama pod make sure the seller is amazon so that you're not buying any bootleg shit and uh you can still order now and get all of your stuff by christmas so plenty of time to do all of that as well all right we got some new uh patrons to shout out like we said at the beginning remember the ten dollar tier is changing for january 2021 per feedback from our listeners and our patrons um if you're at the ten dollar tier uh the five dollar tier and one dollar tier are going to stay the same no worries there the ten dollar tier you're still going to get three bonus shows a month you're still going to get the sunday show early and ad free you're also going to get a quarterly zoom with us so one every few months uh you're going to get to vote once a month on one of the bonus shows and you're also going to get a monthly Bible babble with your pal Dave exclusive to the $10 tier that starts next month, uh, January 2021. If any of you are not $10 patrons and you're interested in that, interested in that, sign up uh, uh, to patreon.com slash Necronomapod and uh, sign up for the $10 tier. We got some new patrons to shout out. Thank you very much to Jessica, Chloe Humphreys, Samantha Clayton, Mackenzie. Frederick Winther, B. Smitty, Nicole Zimmerman, Raul Medina, Mackenzie Behrens, Kayla Warnick, Jemima Ind, Kayla Diaz, Carolina Wagneska, Jane Papaandria, Sarah, Claire Cohen, Eric Downing, Fallen Introvert, Lacey J, Christoph Swager, Luke New, Joshua Burke, and Javier Pandero. Thank you guys very much. We are at patreon.com slash Necronomapod. Ian, what do you got? Before I jump into iTunes, I just have a quick uh, follow-up Patreon. Shout out for Katina Newman. Uh, sounds like she was going through through a tough time, but uh, she commented on some stuff on Patreon. So hope yeah. you're feeling better. Th- thank you for listening. And then for iTunes, I have one for Brain Dead Nerd, Nikki MD, and CPI Cat. Thank you guys for the awesome reviews. Dave, you got anything from your end? Uh, no, nothing in the bad bad review corner this week. I think people are scared. You know, they don't want to get called out in the bad review corner every week. So, no, we well, got no bad when reviews. You're a, when you're a perfect podcast, you don't get any bad reviews. Yeah, so. bring it. Excuse us. Well, we hope you guys enjoyed this show. I know we, uh, you know, we went off on tangents a little bit, but we had been, uh, you know, the last couple of weeks covering uh, the West was, um, you know tough stuff to get through so we got a little goofy tonight but we also uh you know ian put together a fun story and an interesting story so hope you guys enjoyed it we are on twitter facebook instagram youtube at necronomapod don't forget to vote at necronomapod.com for the first show of 2021 that vote is up and the poll will be going on until christmas eve so you have uh you know a couple weeks to get that in but make sure you get your vote in follow us on all the socials And we will talk to you guys next week. All right. You guys ready for a cool down beer? Cheers.